During the early 1900s, Erie, Pennsylvania earned a national reputation for being the freshwater fishing capital of the world. Tons of Lake Erie fish were delivered to downtown and neighboring docks each day from early spring until late winter. Thanks to the local invention of flash freezing, some of this total was sent via railroad trains to big city markets. Local and visiting fish tugs made their way into the lake each morning to harvest whitefish and cisco, a herring species that was almost fished to extinction. There was an international fish war between the United States fishermen and Canada and actual shots were fired. Yellow perch and walleye, two of today's most prized species, were classified as rough fish and largely ignored. But before becoming a state park, Prescott played a significant role in the industry, housing a huge outdoor hatchery, several fish processing companies, and an ice harvesting operation. In this installment of the Accidental Paradise programming series, Dr. David Frew, Jefferson Educational Society scholar in residence, will outline those glory days and present the reasons for their demise. Hello and welcome to the Jefferson Educational Society's digital programming. I'm Ben Spagan and I'm the vice president at the JES and I'm a contributing editor at the Erie Reader. 194 pages, full color, hardcover, dusk jacket and all, Accidental Paradise, the 13,000 year history of Presque Isle, the latest book from Dr. David Frew and his co-author Jerry Skripsack features Presque Isle's natural history and colorful political history, including its creation as that state park in 1921. An important note up front here, folks, uh, published by the JES in cooperation with the Tom Ridge Environmental Center Foundation. I want to thank the folks at Trek for their partnership in this process. For more information on how, where, and when to purchase the book, visit accidentalparadise.com. Joining me here uh, is one of the book's co-authors, Dr. David Frew. He's a scholar in residence at the JES, an emeritus professor at Gannon University, where he held a variety of administrative positions during a 33-year-long career. He's also the emeritus director of the Erie County Historical Society, the Hagen History Center, where he previously had served as the executive director for five years and is president of his own management consulting business. He's authored or co-authored 40 books, including Accidental Paradise, which brings us here together for this program, as well as more than 100 articles, cases, and papers, including his prolific On the Waterfront series for the JES. For a fuller bio, please visit our website, jeserie.org. Now, since this program is first airing live on the JES Facebook page, we'll work our way through as many questions from you, the viewers, as we can as we host this event. If you have a question, just leave it in the comments section. If you're watching a later broadcast or listening to a later broadcast, still send us those questions, those comments to keep the conversation going. And of course, for more information about upcoming JES programs and publications, visit that website, jeserie.org. And be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Dr. David Frew, thank you for coming back and for joining this discussion. Thanks for having me and uh, uh, let's go. <laughs> I'm going to pull up your PowerPoint right now, sir. We'll get this show on the road and we will take questions afterwards. All right, Dr. Frew, the show is yours. Thank you so much. And Ben, as usual, uh, feel free to jump in and interrupt when I go crazy or off the deep end with uh, wacky details, as I know I sometimes do. Uh, one, of the, one of the downfalls of being a, a university professor for so long. Well, one of the uh, awesome and, and obvious things that Presque Isle did uh, physically was to create a harbor to surround Lake Erie and to surround Erie, Pennsylvania, and to make it the town that it is. Without Presque Isle, Erie would be just one of many sort of funky cities hanging on the edge of a great lake. But in addition to its role as a harbor maker, which was, which was augmented by the uh, Corps of Engineers, it served from the very beginning, probably before uh, actual Europeans got here, as a place which attracted fish. So uh, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, lost on everybody that there was a moment in time when uh, Erie, Pennsylvania, because of Presque Isle, that's one of the critical roles of Presque Isle, uh, evolved and became the freshwater capital fishing or freshwater fishing capital of the world. So let's go to the next slide and we'll talk about how this works. There is a, uh, 
uh, a nice picture of the Great Lakes. And most people see the Great Lakes and you see they're not just the Great Lakes, the five Great Lakes with the Georgian Bay appended to the top of uh, Lake Huron. Uh, but the drainage uh, basin uh, that runs water and snow into them. And um, a lot of people think when they imagine Lake Superior and the enormous size of Lake Superior that that's where all the fish would be. In actual fact, there's a kind of a 90-10 water to fish principle that governs the Great Lakes, maybe more like 80-20. I first heard this from the Ohio Sea Grant people. Uh, Lake Erie, although it's one of the smaller of the Great Lakes, certainly by water volume, it's the smallest, uh, has 10% of the water and 90% of the fish. Uh, Lake Superior, that enormous lake up there, it's just not a hospitable place for fish. And even if it worked, how would a fisherman get out there to be catching them in a couple thousand feet of ice cold water in the, in the edge season, seasons? So Erie, Pennsylvania is where the fish were, most of the fish. On to the next slide. Well, here's, here's what's driving fishing in Lake Erie. Here's a nice picture of Lake Erie. And uh, the three things we could say about Lake Erie is it has diversity, it has structure, and it has wetlands. And those are the three things that fish like. Fish don't want a thousand feet of deep water. Uh, you catch fish near shallow water. Uh, fish like the structure, the structure that's associated with those sand spit peninsulas we talked about. So Presque Isle is one of the major sand spit peninsulas on, on Lake Erie. And its uh, role was to attract fish. It had other roles as well with respect to fishing. And interestingly, immediately across the lake from us, Presque Isle's big cousin, Long Point, which is triple the size of Presque Isle, built the same exact way and set up uh, sort of in the reverse. So it uh, sticks in the wrong direction from, from Presque Isle. Uh, it attracted even more fish. In addition to uh, diversity and structure uh, and the wetlands, which we haven't talked about yet, uh, uh, Lake Erie is in effect two lakes. And we talked about that a couple of presentations ago. Uh, the uh, basin that's from Erie to the east is deep. That gives fish an opportunity in the summer to go and seek the temperature that they would like. And to the west, uh, the lake that used to be a separate lake is shallow. So the western basin is pretty shallow. The eastern basin is pretty deep. And uh, the differences there create a diversity, uh, which encouraged lots of different species. So for example, whitefish and cisco, uh, which we'll talk about in a bit, uh, love the deep cold water. And the fish that we like these days, perch, uh, walleye, and blue pike, which is gone from, 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 from us, it's extinct now, uh, they're shallow water creatures. And uh, the, the best genetic explanation for, for walleye is that it was a creature of the deep water. And the reason why it was bluish on the top, as opposed to yellowish, which is the color of walleye or yellow pike, yellow pike, blue pike, was to protect itself from uh, aerial predators like seagulls. So seagulls or, or osprey or eagles or whatever, they look down, they have a way of seeing down into the water and they like to see fish. And uh, some of those guys can go down uh, 20, 30, 40 feet and snag a, feet, a, a snag a fish. But it doesn't see the, the blue pike because the blue pike's blue top and it doesn't see the yellow pike, which is a genetic protection because the yellow pike mostly uh, grows up in the Western basin, which is sandy bottom and shallow. So the yellow top of the yellow pike uh, makes it invisible. Wetlands, critically important for uh, fish. Uh, that's where all the critters come from, that the fish eat, the bugs and mosquitoes and more. And uh, as we may recall from an earlier uh, discussion, uh, on the west end of Lake Erie, uh, there's a place called the Great Black Swamp, 55,000, uh, sorry, 55 million acres of wetland which has unfortunately been converted into farmland by piping. It's now uh, being, there, people are trying to bring that back to its natural order. But in the center of the lake, uh, the great 
pack of wetlands, uh, which creates, in addition to structure and those two, two, two basin diversities, creates all the stuff that fish need to grow and, and thrive. Next uh, slide. So Erie, Pennsylvania was characterized as the freshwater fishing capital of the world. And here are the metrics that made people think that way. The peak of this was maybe 1905 when there were 16 local processors. Those would be the big commercial places that would take the fish from the fishermen and uh, clean them and ice them and send them off to markets. There were seven, at peak, there were 70 licensed local fish tugs. But since this was such a wonderful place to fish, fish tugs came here from everywhere. They came from the western part of the lake, the eastern part of the lake, and from some of the other lakes. People would come down here from Michigan. They'd come down here from the Georgian Bay and from Lake Huron, and they'd tie up uh, temporarily in, in, in uh, Erie, Pennsylvania, and they'd go off fishing. Uh, one of the more interesting things that happened uh, in the early 1900s was something that we call the Ontario Fish Wars. Now, as you could see, uh, Long Point being triple the size of uh, Presque Isle probably uh, was responsible for triple the number of fish. So with all those fish over there and people from Erie, Pennsylvania going out in tugs to catch what they could, they pretty soon found themselves going a little too far across the lake. There are no uh, particular uh, signs out there that say you've crossed into Canadian waters now. And they'd get within a few miles of the shore of Long Point where the fish were, and they'd set up their gill nets. And gill nets were probably uh, the most powerful uh, fishing tool. Uh, if you can uh, imagine a, a, an enormous tennis net underwater, with anchors that take it to the bottom and floats that hold it upright. There were gill nets that were, you know, a half a mile long. And the good thing about uh, gill nets for the fishermen is you could control the size of the openings in the gill nets so that little fish that you didn't care about catching and cleaning could swim right through the openings. And the big fish that might be too big and too difficult tasting to try to process, and maybe we should leave them alone because they might be successful breeders, they would bounce off. During the 1900s, it was estimated by economists that between 15 and 20 percent of Erie's GDP, that's including primary and secondary businesses, uh, was connected to commercial fishing. Uh, so if you think about the fact that miles and there was enough, there were enough gill nets in Erie to stretch around the world two times, that's an odd statistic, and uh, they were made out of ordinary fabric, so they got beat up and they were destroyed, they had to be repaired. So there was hundreds of people uh, fixing, fixing gill nets, uh, and there was hundreds of people cleaning fish, and there were hundreds of people uh, building and maintaining fish tugs. The fish tugs started out being driven by steam engines. And then as technology moved along, they changed to gasoline and diesel. And all that was just an invitation for uh, mechanics. Next slide. There we go. Well, one day they woke up over on the Canadian side and said, wait a minute they're coming and taking our fish. They can't do that. And one, one of the reasons why there wasn't a, a faster reaction to that is if you'd go, gone over to Port Dover in 1905, which is uh, the biggest port behind uh, Long Point, uh, it was essentially a small berg. Uh, there were no steam tugs over there. There wasn't all that much fishing. What fishing there was going on over there commercially was shore-based with pound nets. Uh, and it, it took a while for them to figure out how much we were, how much we were taking, how, how, many, how many fish we were taking. And as soon as they caught on to that, uh, there was an announcement that the, 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 the American fishing on the Canadian side was going to end. Of course, that created a little bit of a sort of a, of a joke and a challenge for the American fishermen. Loads of American fishermen had uh, fish tugs that were big enough and fast enough to outrun the ship that you see there, which was their revenue ship. That was the second version. And that ship had a, a couple of machine guns mounted on it. 
but they were permanently mounted. So you knew that if you could get to the side of the ship, they couldn't hit you with it because they couldn't swivel it. They couldn't pick it up. And chances are, uh, if you used your head, you could outrun these guys. So what they would do if they uh, could find somebody fishing over there is they would shoot at them and try to warn them off. And once in a while, uh, there was a fracas in which somebody got hurt. A couple of people were actually killed uh, during the fish wars, 1908, 1909. Next slide. Well, here's an interesting picture of, of, of a, an American fisherman who got captured. And this is a classic picture. You've probably seen this a time or two. That's the uh, Erie fish tug, uh, E.C. Ogle. And it's uh, on, the, on the hard at Port Dover. If you've been to Port Dover a couple of times, you recognize the lighthouse there behind it. It's the same lighthouse that's still there. You might recognize the dock and you might see the vigilance sitting back behind it with the steam pouring out of it. And the people who were there would be uh, in the foreground on the left, that would be the crew of the vigilant. And uh, the captain of the vigilant is tipping his hat and hamming for the camera. And the American guys that used to own and operate the Ogle are sitting there dejected because they don't know what's going to happen to them. Generally speaking, nobody did hard time. The worst thing that happened to the American crews were that they lost their nets, they lost their fish, maybe lost their tugs, and maybe lost their tugs for a while, were able to buy them back. So that's the classic picture of uh, the EC Ogle. I believe that was taken in 19, 1909 uh, when it was unfortunately captured. Eventually they got smart enough and good enough to sort of pretty much discourage all the Americans from going over there and fishing, but it never totally ended. Next slide. When Erie was a fishing port, uh, lots of fun things happened here. In addition to the fish, uh, we all recognize the fact that Erie is kind of famous for uh, pepperoni balls. Pepperoni balls, sponge candy, and ox roast. Those are the three things that my grandkids or my kids want when they come back here. They, those are all things associated with, uh, with Erie, Pennsylvania. Story of pepperoni balls is that uh, uh, when, a, when a fish tongue was coming in, it would blow its horn or its steam whistle in a, in a pattern, and the ladies who lived along the, along the uh, bluffs on the east side, who were the regular fish processing uh, cleaners, cutters as they called them back then, would uh, spring to action, run down and uh, get, get in line and get ready. And they were paid by the finished pound. Uh, so there was not all that much waste, but if you've seen anybody clean fish, no matter how good they are cleaning fish, you know, there's waste. Uh, uh, it's a, it's a, a game you play of getting it done fast versus, uh, you know, getting all the meat. When those ladies were done uh, with, uh, with uh, cutting fish or cleaning fish, filleting fish, which was, by the way, probably invented by the Colbys of Erie, Pennsylvania and Port Dover, uh, they asked permission to take garbage bags or whatever bags they had in those days and take the remains, the cuttings, which had a lot of good meat on them and take them home with them. And uh, a tradition emerged in which they would haul those uh, cuttings uh, up to their homes. They would sit in their kitchens and they would meticulously pick little bits of fish off. They would uh, bake the fish. First, they would fry the fish. This is the formula. Then they would take dough uh, and then they would stick this, the fried fish in the dough and then they would bake the dough. So originally, uh, pepperoni balls were fish balls. And all the bakeries along Erie's east side uh, featured those, and people just loved them. They would buy them by the dozens. And kind of what happened when the uh, blue pike went extinct and there was nothing uh, left to stick in those dough balls is the demand for uh, the fried balls continued, but there's nothing to stick in them, so pepperoni was substituted. Gill nets were not invented here. They were invented in the western end of Lake Erie, uh, but they didn't work there because the topography wasn't right. You need, you need deep water for a gill net to work right. Someone by the name of Nash uh, came up here in the middle 1800s and started experimenting with gill nets and they were just fantastic. So uh, gill nets were not invented here, but they were perfected here. And uh, tug design, uh, the evolution of uh, steam, steam tugs to diesel tugs from flat bottom boats to closed off boats, the design that we now call turtlebacks, which you can see in the picture there, uh, that happened right here 
or maybe somewhere between here and Port Dover. Next slide. So here's a 130 year harvest history, uh, you know, in short, Ontario, New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Michigan uh, in 1890, caught 141 million commercial pounds of fish. In 2020, uh, that total had changed to 19 million. Important to note that the modern totals include fish that no one would have eaten in the old days, rough fish as they were called then, and invasive fish. And the two most uh, important and disturbing invasive fish are rainbow smelt, uh, which was not native to the lakes. It was introduced here uh, by sports fishermen in Lake Michigan, didn't like Lake Michigan very much and came here and filled up Lake Erie and the ordinary carp, not the jumping or, or Asian carp that we're scared about and reading about, but uh, ordinary carp, they were brought here, story will come later. Other rough fish that nobody would have thought about eating in those days were burbot, which some people call ling cod, white perch, which is today uh, marketed, it's been rebranded uh, re as Lake Erie perch, and drum, sheep's head. Uh, Commercial fishing on the United States side of the lake is now limited. For one thing, gillnets have been banned. And uh, commercial fishing continues in Ontario, which causes people on this side of the lake to get all nuts and think that there's something horrible happening there. But commercial fishing in Ontario is strictly re regulated. It's not regulated in the way that it was here, which was almost not regulated. And in, in Ontario, gill netting continues. There's two kinds of uh, uh, commercial fishing in Ontario. There's trawling to control the rainbow schmelt population. And the trawlers only catch rainbow schmelt. If they catch something else by accident, it's quite a burden because they have to clean it and turn it in when they're inspected every day. And uh, the second kind of netting or fishing that goes on in Ontario, still goes on, is uh, gill netting, strictly regulated. Next slide. Well, where did all those fish go? How did we go from all those pounds to hardly any pounds? Well, here's a picture that tells a story. Uncontrolled, unregulated commercial fishing. Here's a picture from 1919 of one uh, ship, one fish tug. This is in Sandusky, I believe, called the Earl Bess, harvesting 33,000 pounds of Cisco. That used to be the most popular fish in Lake Erie, which is almost now it's extinct. It's close to being extinct. Commercial fishermen, it's interesting, don't even recognize it. They think it's a small white fish when they see it. Uh, by the way, there are two spellings of Cisco. It's either with, a zero, with an O at the end or an OE, depending upon what country. But uh, there's where the fish went. We caught them all. And to catch fish like this, you have to go out during uh, breeding season, uh, which is the dumbest time of all to go harvest all the fish. Next slide. So here's a fish that almost disappeared. We're lucky we got this back. Uh, there was a sturgeon processing company, and there were two sturgeon processing companies in Erie, both on Presque Isle. And uh, the reason we suddenly decided that sturgeon was a pretty interesting fish to catch, prior to that it was thought of as a nuisance fish, is that sturgeon eggs are caviar. And caviar is a delicacy, as you know, if you've seen that fabulous episode of Frasier. Uh, sturgeon fish uh, with swim bladders uh, are the source of isinglass, and in the 1890s and early 1900s, if you didn't have isinglass, you couldn't make buggy windows. So isinglass is that stuff that you remember it being the, the sort of uh, plasticky looking material in the, in the back of your convertible in 1949 or 50 or whatever. Also, pretty soon they discovered that sturgeon was a pretty good meat. Uh, after you harvested the caviar and the isinglass, you could slice it up and uh, you know, dry the meat and serve it. In fact, one of the one of the processes that happened on Presque Isle is that they would slice the slice the sturgeons sturgeon and take them out and bury them in the sand on the lake. This is before it was a state park and people were swimming and then come back two, three days later and uh, take the dried meat and put it in cans. They would can it. So there was a cannery out there, cannery, Erie's Cannery Row. Next slide. Cisco, or it's a herring, was at one time Erie's most valuable commercial species, and there she be, beautiful fish, 
mild, uh, kind of like a whitefish, only milder, big, uh, bigger than a blue pike or a yellow pike, smaller than a whitefish, really good tasting. And uh, they were easy to ship. Uh, you could ice them down, gut them, ice them down, and they would last forever. And you would get one of these and bake it. People didn't fillet them. Next slide. And of course, the fabled blue pike, which was fished to extinction. Uh, the story of how that ha actually happened is, is detailed in Accidental Paradise. It's now gone. There's hope that we might find it here, there, or the other place, or be able to uh, dig some, some DNA out of an old freezer someplace that we, where, we found, where, where we found one, but no, nothing like that has worked yet. Next slide. Why did the fish disappear? Well, the overriding reason was greed. There was overfishing and there was no regulation. People went out during spawning season and harvested because the fish were so easy to catch. And then there was commercial technology that made things worse. There were fish tugs that could fly around the lake at warp speed relative to how the old guys used to fish in sailboats and rowing boats and set nets. Gill nets were just potent fish catching machines. And then flash freezing. Uh, I know you think of, of flash freezing, you think of maybe bird's eye, Clarence Bird's eye, especially if you've read the book Ice, which is a good read by the way. But flash freezing got invented like this. There was a family of commercial fishermen in Erie by the name of Colby, and they went over to Port Dover. And uh, they came up with a, a brilliant solution to the how you could catch Canadian fish and process them problem. Uh, they had uh, processing businesses on both sides of the lake, and they would catch a load of fish wherever, mostly on the Canadian side. They would take it to their processing center and uh, process the fish, and it was perfectly legal to bring the processed fish to Erie, Pennsylvania, and sell them from here. So we had the market they had the fish and the Colbys figured out how to take advantage of the new rules and get around the fish war problem. There's only one thing that the Colby family thought that would help this and that would be if they could figure out a way to freeze the fish. You could get way more for a Lake Erie filet, a perch or a walleye or a blue pike. This was maybe long before perch were interesting. They were too small. If you could take it to New York or Chicago where people were just crazy to get freshwater fish because they were so much tastier than the saltwater stuff that came to them after sitting you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a container of ice, maybe half thawed out for a month or whatever. So Colby sent his youngest son, Robert, to Rensselaer Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in upstate New York, which is at the time kind of like Stanford. In uh, Robert Colby's graduating class was the guy that invented television and the guy that invented the diode. So that was where technology was happening. And he was sent there on a mission to invent uh, commercial freezing. And by his junior year, he had done so. And they patented commercial freezing in both Erie, Pennsylvania and Port Dover. So it was an American and a Canadian patent. And they were doing this. They would catch the fish and take the fish to Port Dover. And then they would pick up a previously caught load of fish that were flash frozen. They'd drive them to Erie frozen, load them on trains and send them to either New York or Chicago. And the trains went right down to the docks in those days. So the Colby fish plant was uh, roughly where uh, Smugglers is these days. The building is still there. That's on the Erie side and on the uh, Canadian side, it's just, it was right along the dock. Uh, flash freezing changed everything. And there's a really fun Robert, Robert Colby story. Uh, he got the two patents in his junior year. His senior year, he was throwing his stuff in his duffel bag about to go back to Rensselaer to take his last year of school and graduate. He's leaving Port Dover, of course. And his dad said, hey, where are you going? He said, I'm going back to school. And his dad said, no, 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 you're done. You did what I sent you there for. I'm not paying your tuition. So Robert got mad at his father and his family, and he took his duffel bags and he went to Rensselaer. And he sat down with his faculty member friends and said, I'm stuck. And they paid his tuition for him and gave him a tuition, gave him uh, his senior year. He graduated from Rensselaer and he didn't really go back to be with the family for years. Came back to Erie, Pennsylvania, lived on Kakwa, 
uh, after a couple of stays in other uh, various exciting ports and eventually ended up running the Erie side of the Colby business after his dad passed away. Another problem is we have introduced invasive species, smelt and carp. And uh, what carp do is they eat all the food and wipe out all the, uh, all the structure that the regular fish would like. Another reason for the demise, and I know this sounds sort of uh, counterintuitive, is fish hatcheries, both federal and state. We'll tell that story in a moment. And the last reason for the, the, the loss of the fish population is the loss of Great Lakes wetlands. So we've totally wiped out the Great Black Swamp, which is on the west end, uh, feeding uh, Lake Erie. And uh, if you uh, ride around and look at places where there used to be wetlands on both sides of Lake Erie, Conneaut, Ashtabula, Erie, Presque Isle, uh, wetlands have disappeared at an alarming rate. No wetlands, no food. Next slide. Well, here's where federal hatcheries got their start. Uh, Lake Ontario had a wonderful native salmon population, uh, which was collapsing in the 1800s. And everybody was wondering what was going on. And of course, it was pretty simple. They were overfishing the salmon. Salmon have to go up creeks to spawn. And uh, fishermen with uh, hammers and harpoons and, and sledges and rakes and whatever would just catch these poor things when they were trying to, trying to uh, propagate their species. And as the population was collapsing at an upper Canadian, this was before Canada was Canada, Canada became Canada in 1867. In 1864 in Upper Canada, that would be Ontario, a biologist by the name of Samuel Wilmot started uh, experimenting. He started extracting eggs and milk, which was pretty easy to do. When you catch a fish uh, during its uh, spawning season, if it's a female fish, uh, the eggs will come pouring out. If it's a male fish, uh, the milt comes out. So he learned that it was pretty easy for him to mix the eggs and the milk and raise salmon in his basement. And he waited till 1867, right after Canadian Confederation. He, made, he was appointed the head of Canadian Canada Marine and Fisheries. That's the federal outfit that's in charge of uh, all that sort of thing. And uh, he announced that he could save the Great Lakes whitefish and Cisco population by using hatcheries. Next slide. Uh, by the 1880s, there were Great Lakes fed federal hatchery programs in Canada and the United States was doing it as well. And uh, sadly, as if you started to study this, as the federal hatcheries were approaching peak production, the Lake Erie catch totals of both whitefish and uh, Cisco were for collapsing. Uh, during that period, the Lake Erie Cisco catch fell from 45 million pounds to 13 million pounds. Lake Erie's whitefish catch fell from 3.7 million pounds to 1.1 million pounds in 1895. So uh, the federal government went to land grant universities, that's the United States federal government, and said, hey, help us out. Uh, take on commercial fishing and uh, tell us uh, how what we're doing wrong here, how we can how we can fix this. And of course, the land grant university said this is pretty simple. All you have to do is regulate commercial fishing. Don't let them catch all they want. Don't let them, don't let them uh, fish during spawning season. But that was so unpopular politically. There were so many different political entities involved in this, four states plus Ontario, that nobody wanted to try to do that. Uh, the academic researchers pretty soon began to go even further and say that the hatcheries were dysfunctional, that a released hatchery fish were destroying the native population and making it tank. So now the United States Fish Commission is panicked and they don't know what to do. And they're studying what people are doing in Europe. And they learned that in Europe, a really popular food fish, which is very easy to, uh, uh, to raise uh, either in farms or in uh, controlled uh, cir circumstances in small lakes is the carp. So um, talk to Jewish families about their favorite uh, thing, uh, gefilte fish, uh, that's carp. Uh, however, the difference between the carp that Europeans were eating is that carps that Europeans were eating were fed intelligently 
uh, and uh, they weren't turned loose to be brush hogs uh, running around eating whatever they sucked off, uh, off the bottom. So uh, uh, carp that you eat these days tastes something like dirt, unless they've been uh, very carefully uh, processed. I've eaten some carp that were really good, but I wouldn't really do it on purpose. It was one of those, hey, try this. Isn't that good? What do you think you just ate? Oh, my God. Uh, so here's what the United States Fish Commission began to do. They began to import and distribute carp eggs. And as they were doing that, they put their own federal hatcheries out of business and they argued that carp was going to solve the problem. They're going to replace whitefish. While they're doing that, the Canadians uh, are going to their own universities asking, does, it make, does this make any sense? And the Canadians said, absolutely not. Next slide. In 1895, Pennsylvania decided to come to the rescue of the loss of the federal hatcheries. Um, they figured that maybe they could start hatcheries. Uh, so while two major studies of Great Lakes fishing concluded that licensing regulation and cat catch limits would be the only answer to controlling the fish population, uh, the Pennsylvania Fish Commission decided that they were gonna do something different. They built, they built a fish hatchery at Second and Sassafras and uh, they were using a lake or they were using uh, city of Erie water. Uh, of course, that's the only thing they had. And that was just before the cholera epidemics. Uh, so the city of Erie water wasn't chlorinated yet. But when the city of Erie decided that it had to chlorinate its municipal water, the hatchery had to be closed because you can't raise fish in uh, chlorinated water. And down at that hatchery at Second and Sassafras, they were trying to raise the popular fish for fishermen. That would have been the blue pike, uh, yellow pike, whitefish, and cisco. Eventually, the land grant colleges generated so much negative research that uh, people started to think of uh, fat hatcheries as being awful. Next slide. In 1910, uh, the secretary of the Pennsylvania Fish Commission, partially in a, in a move to save his job uh, and to uh, get over the embarrassment of what he was doing with fish hatcheries, decided he was going to create the largest uh, natural fish hatchery in the world. So he acquired the use of 12,000 acres on Presque Isle. Generally speaking, he took over the lagoons. He got permission to do that from the United States Congress which decided that they kind of owned the uh, eastern end of the peninsula because that's where all the military stuff was happening. They hired Gillespie dredging and brought a huge dredge from Pittsburgh here. They put the dredge in Misery Bay. They set up a multi-billion workstation. There are still pictures of this, aerial photographs. And they began creating the world's largest natural fish hatchery with the attendant publicity. R.A. Bueller was going to be the savior of commercial fishing in Lake Erie and elsewhere. Next slide. So if we could go back to our thinking about the lagoons and what the lagoons were, the lagoons uh, were the ponds that were between the ridges uh, that Otto Jennings identified on Presque Isle. So you'd have two ridges with the pond in between it and left to its natural devices, what was supposed to be happening as, as you move from uh, the, uh, uh, the newer end, the west end of Presque Isle, to the older end, the east end of Presque Isle, those ponds were supposed to be drying up and getting smaller. So uh, if you remember the lagoons at their peak, uh, you could throw your, uh, uh, actually there's a time when you could drive through there with a powerboat. You could go into uh, Misery Bay, drive through, through the lagoons in an engine driven craft, not allowed to do that anymore. You go all the way through the lagoons and come out in the marine and come out the other side. And even after they ended that, you could easily paddle through there with kayaks and canoes. These days, uh, the park is allowing the uh, lagoons to revert to their natural order. Uh, where they shouldn't ever ha ever have been connected and they should have been turning into uh, wetlands as you move from the west to the east. Next slide. So here's Otto Jennings pictures of the lagoons and you can find all this stuff in the book if you want to see how this happened. And now here's what the Fish Commission did. Next slide. Uh, first they went into Graveyard Pond uh, you all know Graveyard Pond when you're going over the steel bridge just after uh, Misery Bay. 
that's the pond to the left that houses today's um, boat livery where you can rent up uh, paddle boards and canoes and stuff. Well, the centrif went in there and they dredged uh, graveyard pond so that instead of being three or four or five feet, it was 15 feet deep at minimum and they dredged uh, from the uh, east end to the west end so they'd be able to keep big ships and boats in there. By the way, uh, the reason why graveyard pond became named graveyard pond is that was the place where people used to push old boats when they were done with them. It was just full of old uh, boat remains, not because they buried people there. Then they continued their dredging to the west. They dredged six additional ponds to 12 feet in depth. Wasn't how it should have been. Uh, the lagoons, as they were comprised as ponds between ridges, uh, might have been, you know, three, four feet deep at, at the west end and might have been uh, no feet deep. It might, might have been wetlands on the west end. Then they continued, the, they connected the ponds, big environmental mistakes, so that uh, none of them had its own uh, unique ecology. And they put screened gates between them so the water could flow through. And what they were trying to accomplish there was to create a flow to keep the fish that they were going to raise in there happy. Uh, the way that the lighthouse keeper used to get to the lighthouse is he would, uh, he would uh, take a small boat, he would go into uh, the Misery Bay area, and he would go into a little inlet called Hobo's Inlet, uh, which would get him almost uh, to where today's lighthouse path is on the, on the north end from which distance he walked. Uh, they eliminated Hobo's uh, uh, Inlet. Then, as you would guess, the funding for this was running out because it was going on for a long time and um, people were reluctant to give more money to this and it seemed like a crazy idea. Meanwhile, he was spending all this money and he came up with one last ditch way to try to save his project. He announced to the local people that he was going to solve Erie's mosquito problem, that he could eliminate the mosquitoes that bit people at night in the summer in Erie, Pennsylvania. And to do that, he sent his workers between the ponds that he was dredging and making 12 feet deep to brush hog everything. And that means there was no more wetlands, no more structure. And uh, he took the dredging spoils and spread them over the top of the brush hogging. If you can imagine a dumber thing to do to a place that was supposed to be a natural fish habitat, it would be hard uh, and this guy was the head of the Fish Commission. Next slide. We do not have any pictures of what they did uh, during those years uh, of, of dredging. But from 1957, uh, I'll make a note that that fabulous marina that I kept a boat at for 15 years and loved, my family and my kids grew up there, that four or 500 boat marina with all the services there, that was not there before. That used to be a, a little skimpy pond. And the way they uh, took a little skimpy wetland slash pond and made it into a big open marina, which is 15 feet deep everywhere and boats go in there and anchor and you can have a, a docks and full service marina with uh, fuel, that's a problem. And uh, pump outs for, uh, for uh, sewage, another problem. If you take a dredge, this is not the, the original dredge and uh, you just start chewing up the bottom and letting the water flow in. And what you can see they're doing there is they're sluicing the sand that they're sucking up onto the side of the marina to create some structure. Uh, the, uh, white, the white ribbon there would be uh, uh, the road that used to go around the peninsula, Fisher Drive. So that's, that's a picture of how, how dredging works. And you can see in front of the dredge uh, what, that, uh, what that pond slash wetland used to look like. And you know, know, you know what it looks like now. It's a giant big uh, basin. Dumb. So rough fish, uh, as a result of the disappearance of uh, the prized fish, became prized species. And here's the two that we're after these days. F uh, perch on your left, the yellow perch, the prized yellow perch, tasty fish, and the walleye. And these days, pe people are catching walleye like crazy. The walleye seem to be... Uh, out, out predating the perch. The walleye are incredibly 
um, vicious things. They'll they'll eat perch. They'll just they'll they'll eat. If you go to where little perch are, that's where there's going to be walleye there eating them. But uh, bear in mind that until some few years ago, nobody really cared about these fish. I guess they cared a little bit about the uh, yellow pike or walleye because it was worth uh, cleaning. Uh, the, the, some people call that a pickerel. If you're catching walleye and you're not in the Erie, Pennsylvania area, you would call that a pickerel. Next slide. And by the way, uh, like lots of people go out for a perch dinner and uh, they see, oh, perch sandwich, $6.95. That'd be great. I'm going to get one of those. Uh, and here's my question to you. When you order your next perch dinner, is it really a perch? And the answer is it probably is not. So there's a yellow perch at the top of a pile of ice there. And there's a, uh, uh, a white perch rebranded. So yellow perch at the dock is 20 bucks a pound cleaned in fillets. And white perch at the dock is $3 a pound cleaned and filleted. So if you see a, a fillet that you're about to eat on your, on your dish, uh, that's uh, maybe a little bigger than you would expect. Uh, and it came in a box that said Lake Erie Perch. I'm going to take a wild guess that it's the perch on the bottom, not the perch on the top. I'm in the middle of doing a, uh, I'm in the middle of uh, doing a, a study of fishermen uh, to see if they'd like to go high tech and use a, an interesting fish app. And I've been uh, hanging out with commercial fishermen and watching them and commercial fishing, two commercial fisher guys came in with, uh, with clients uh, off the lake uh, maybe a week ago. And I was down when they landed. I wanted to give questionnaires to everybody. These commercial fishermen for a price, a hefty price, will take you out to catch fish. And uh, they tell you that you're going to want to catch walleye. So they're out there and they know where to go and they have fish finders and your limit is six. And these walleye are huge, uh, you know, enormous, easy to clean, good to eat. So they came back with six clients. And the six clients had 36 walleye, of course. They each got their limit. That makes them want to come back and go charter fishing again. Then they each had uh, seven or eight, each had seven or eight white perch and the white perch are big. And when the, uh, the, when the clients, mostly from Pittsburgh, uh, were catching those white perch, they're saying, wow, can we keep those? Can we eat those? And the charter guy said, well, you can, but uh, yeah, we wouldn't want to eat them. And they said, well, we'd like to keep them. So uh, I'm watching these guys uh, who perform the service of cleaning the fish for their clients, uh, fillet yellow pikes so fast you can hardly see their fingers move. And now they're filleting the, uh, the yellow, they're the white perch and they're handing them these and they're saying to them, don't mix these up. <laughs> you don't want to cook these together. And uh, when the happy charter uh, clients left, I asked the uh, charter guys in both cases, would you eat those? They said, never. So Ontario still has that commercial fishing industry. Here's a picture taken at Port Dover of a uh, commercial fish tug ready to go out and catch fish. When you see one of those uh, purple looking uh, uh, sleds or slides that you see in the foreground there, that means they're rigged for, uh, for uh, trawling, trawling only for, only for uh, uh, schmelt. Why am I a fan of Ontario's commercial fishing industry? For one thing, I worked over there for 10 years, uh, writing about, I was, I was given the mission of writing books and, and cases and articles about commercial fishing. And the great thing about commercial fishing in, uh, in Canada, in Ontario, is it's supply control. So uh, the uh, Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources goes out every year, does careful study of the likely size of the biomass of species. Then they set commercial fish catching limits uh, for each uh, species. There's some fish you can catch all you want, carp, sheephead, if you want to catch those and keep them, they're yours and you can do what you like. But if you're catching perch or yellow pike or whitefish, what they're catching, or now they're starting to catch Cisco again on the west end of the lake. Uh, most of the commercial fishermen don't recognize them. They just think they're small and tasty whitefish, which is how they're being marketed. Uh, you, have a, you have a limit that's doled out to you quarterly in the same way that uh, uh, the people in Canada limit softwood dairy products, eggs, and all, all that kind of stuff. So 
in addition to uh, being cautious about limiting uh, how much fish is being taken, uh, much to the chagrin of the fishermen who want to be licensed to go out and do whatever they want, but they can't because they'll lose their licenses and it's, it's, it's too difficult for them economically. Uh, they keep fabulous records. So if anybody knows how many fish are in Lake Erie and how they're doing, uh, it would be the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resource. They have a website where you can go and see such fun things as what's in the stomach of the average commercially caught yellow perch. If you're a fisherman, you might want to know that. And the answer is, on average, 1.5 gobies. So I know we're all worried about uh, this invasive species, gobies, taking over the planet. And when they first came here, it looked like nothing was going to stop them. But I guess what's maybe going to stop them are yellow perch because they're eating them. And uh, if you use a goby uh, as live bait, which may or may not be legal to catch yellow perch, uh, you'll, you'll not find a better bait. Next slide. There's a hopeful future. Uh, and the hopeful future is connected to science and cooperation between the states and Ontario. Uh, there's an organization called the Great Lakes Commission, uh, which is watching all, which, which is watching over all this, including the, the, the lake levels. Uh, there are uh, individual state conservation agencies that do wonderful work, Ohio, Michigan, New York, and Pennsylvania. Uh, we have a Sea Grant operation at Penn State Barron in Erie, Pennsylvania. And there's one at Ohio State that has a summer operation at, at Put-in Bay. Uh, there's the Prescott State Park Regional Science Consortium. Uh, Long Point has become a biosphere, uh, which is hopeful. Uh, there are private conservation groups. My favorite around here is the Save Our Native Species guys, 4,000 local guys that are helping to make things better, doing things like cleaning up the lake, cleaning up the creek, making the uh, access uh, to fish and bucket fishermen on the lake work, brand new fishing uh, station that they created at the foot of Holland Street. There's way improved science. In fact, this year what's happening is they're catching the, the uh, uh, Pennsylvania uh, uh, the Boat and Fish Commission is catching walleye in nets, and then they're sticking uh, small tracking uh, devices in them, and then watching where they go and what they go. There's also now farm-raised fish. So when you go to Wegmans and you try to buy yourself a perch, you'll see some perch that look like the right color and the right size sitting uh, behind the counter. And I'm sure other stores have this as well. And uh, they're, they're yellow perch, but they're not, they're not native. They're not coming out of the lake. They're being raised in ponds in Ohio. Uh, I don't know if that means they taste better or they're more or less healthy, uh, but farmed raised fish are coming. And there's uh, university research happening everywhere. Uh, some of the notable universities are Guelph, uh, Virginia Tech, Michigan, which is in the middle of trying to understand what's happening to the Schmelt population. Purdue, uh, all kinds of uh, universities have taken up the, the mantle of re doing research on, on Great Lakes fisheries. And there's the sea grants that we spoke about before. Next slide. Is it, we're done. So that is it. And I, I wanna thank you, Dr. Fru, for going through a lot of that history with us in, in a remarkable amount of time. So I wanna thank you for that uh, up front and remind folks that are tuning in live to this program, uh, we are taking your questions, your comments in the comments section, so you can leave them there. Uh, I'll, I'll pull down the slide deck in a second to do that. But Dr. Fru, that was a lot to go through. I've got to ask, when you were looking at the research for Accidental Paradise, so what surprised you the most or stood out the most to you when you were taking a look at uh, Erie's history as being the freshwater fishing capital of the world and how we got to where we are today? What, what surprised you or stood out the most over, over overall what you've learned? Well, I, the, the discovery of that uh, Presque Isle uh, outdoor natural hatchery, that was shocking and new to me. I didn't really know that. There were notes here, there, and the other place, but I, I didn't really learn as much as I had to learn about that until I followed it. My first sense that there was something crazy going on is when Presque Isle decided to figure out where to put a road. They hired a aerial photographer from Buffalo to fly over the bay and take pictures and turn around and fly back and take more pictures. And I have all those pictures. And uh, there are aerial picture, aerial photographs of Misery Bay taken in 1923. 
uh, and all that stuff is still out there. All that's all the, the, the dredges and the work boats and the houses, they're still all there. And uh, I could focus in and ask, what was that? <coughs> and it took me a while to catch on to the fact that that was connected to the fish, to the fish and, and game commission. And they had to work backwards from that and see the details of this. This is sort of a, an operation that, that, be, that went on to the down low. In later years, they decided to reestablish a fish hatchery on the bayfront, which you'll remember if you're old enough to have gone to Chestnut Pool. The fish hatchery was right next door in the beautiful brick building, which has been refurbished and become the center of Erie's water authority. And uh, that, that fish hatchery had lovely fish in it. It was uh, like visit and see the, see the fish and have a good time. It wasn't a serious uh, hatchery in the sense of generating fish. The state has shifted its, uh, its uh, hatchery focus to stream fish, to trout. So uh, if you'll go back to one of those earlier art articles that I wrote, how does the osprey know? Uh, there's a moment in uh, March where the uh, state uh, brings its uh, freshly hatched stupid trout that have been raised on corn and pours them into the two settling basins at uh, Waterworks. And usually the day before or two days before that happens, we don't know if they're, if they're uh, studying the emails or whatever, a couple of sets of nesting osprey show up in the trees and they start diving for those. That's like pretty easy pickings. And you can, you can, that's a nice, it's fun fishing for those little trout for kids, but you're not allowed to use corn. That's not fair. Uh, but for a while, the osprey uh, go crazy out there. And the, the, the new thinking of the fish commission, and I don't want to, I, I want to commend them for what they're doing because they're doing good work, is stalking uh, the streams that go out into the lake, coho, lake trout, uh, you know, inland fishing. And, and uh, thinking about that, one of the questions from the, the comment section here on the, the Facebook post of, for this program, the person's asking, you know, cl clearly we, we figured out we were getting it wrong too late. But you know, was there a specific moment that we can look at of all the history, that 130 year history you gave us? When, when were the alarms ringing and when did we hear them? Well, the alarms were ringing in the early 1900s. Everybody was ringing the alarms simultaneously and they were all saying, uh, you regulate them, but don't regulate me. And the, the political football there, like, you know, uh, does Michigan wanna give up commercial fishing and let those fish get caught by Ohio? Does Ohio want to give up commercial fishing and let those fish get caught by Pennsylvania? Uh, the, only, uh, the, the only entity here, and they're bigger and they have more to gain and lose from this, uh, which has been on top of this, was Ontario. I think Ontario pretty much uh, did most of the right things. Uh, another fun question here. Uh, we, we know Erie appreciates its pepperoni balls, but uh, does, did you come across any recipes for the fish balls, the original iteration of that? And how, how can we get those back into local restaurants today? Well, you're going to have to figure out what kind of fish you could get a hold of that wouldn't be too expensive that you could stuff into balls and, and do the same thing with. Now, there are people that I know uh, that after they've, after they've cleaned their perch, and then I know people that do this, people after they've cleaned their perch and their walleye, uh, they pick off little bits here, there, and the other place and they uh, recreate fish balls. It's pretty easy if you know how to fry a dough ball or bake a dough ball. Uh, that's not a challenge. So for the average uh, fisherman looking to make sure that they are doing the right thing when it comes to not overfishing, not uh, going into places they shouldn't, what, what are the top three things that you would recommend to them? Essentially, on a small level, what sort of things should we be mindful of, of our own individual impact when it comes to this topic? Well, you know, I, I love uh, Sons. I'm a member of Sons. I've been a member of Sons forever. And they do such incredible work. Uh, so uh, I would say the average fisherman should spend $5 or more, you could spend whatever you want, and join Sons and go to some meetings and, and read their monthly newsletter, which is cleverly called The Bucket. And uh, if, if, if you go fishing, if you want to get into fishing and you go to Kmart and buy yourself a rod and reel, which you can do, and uh, find somebody that can teach you and show you, uh, you know, you can't go wrong. And you could go out, there's a couple of commercial uh, boats down at the dock, uh, the Perch Pirate, for example, that'll take you out uh, perch fishing in a lake. And uh, you could go with a charter person. I, I, it's probably a little expensive, but 
I've been out a couple of times, several times myself. It's nothing more fun than landing, you know, a, a giant uh, walleye and then having the guy that takes you out uh, clean it. Uh, I went out with Steve Skripsack, who's Jerry Skripsack's son, and uh, watched him fillet. Uh, he, he, he filleted a walleye in less than a minute. Now, when I fillet a wallet, walleye, it looks like when I'm done, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, <sighs> massacre has happened in my kitchen, and I have the tiny piece of meat left over that my wife laughs at me and says, okay, that would be good for a fishbowl. <laughs> uh, the people that know how to do this and they, they'll give you good lessons uh, uh, can teach you and or you could take your fish that you catch to uh, poor Richards on Westlake Road and say here and they'll clean them for you. Plenty of great lessons for us here today and uh, great history, great, uh, great knowledge. We appreciate you sharing it with us. We are nearly out of time, but before we are, I, I would uh, want to remind folks that were tuning in. Uh, you mentioned a few pre uh, previous installments of this series. Those are available free to download, uh, free to watch, stream on demand, uh, jesseries.org. And you just mentioned uh, uh, the Chestnut Street Pole, as well as uh, the Osprey, and both of those available to read on the Waterfront series, uh, all available to read uh, free to download, jesseries.org. But Dr. David Fru, JES scholar in residence and co-author of Accidental Paradise, a 13,000 year history of Presque Isle. Thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing your knowledge and expertise and taking the time, energy, and effort to share them with us here in conversation. Thanks for having me. It was great fun. And of course, a big thanks to the many, many uh, folks that helped this project become a reality, including the Tom Ridge Environmental Center Foundation. For more information on how, where, and when to purchase uh, Accidental Paradise, 13,000 Year History of Presque Isle, do visit their website, uh, the, the website the Trek Foundation has set up for this, accidentalparadise.com. And of course, thanks to all of you watching along at home, whether you're tuning in uh, to watch these live in real time or streaming it on demand. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Without you, the exchange of information and ideas would not be possible. Friendly reminder to stream other JES digital programs on demand. Head over to that website, jesery.org, where you'll also find details about other upcoming JES programs, as well as a wide range of publications from quick, timely reads to reports, essays, and more free to download, including Dr. Fru's On the Waterfront series. And be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. For the Jefferson Educational Society, I'm Ben Spagan. Be safe, be sound, and thanks for listening and learning with us. Night, everybody.